Hey guys, Jim Vanoski with Manufacturing Talks. Welcome back. Well, you missed the live show, the first one. It was last Friday, but here we are on Tuesday. And with the wonder of technology, you still get to see it. So last week's show with Mark Mills, which was phenomenal. Here it is in all its glory. Just stay tuned for a few minutes and you can hear it for yourself. Welcome to Manufacturing Talks with Jim Vanosky. Industry has a million cool stories, and Jim talks to the movers and shakers who are making them happen. Let's dive in. Okay, welcome to Manufacturing Talks Live. Live for the first time ever. I'm Jim Vanosky. I am your host, and I am very happy to be here today. Um, it's a great Friday. It's beautiful outside here in Michigan, and um, we're starting things off here happy. We'll talk about that here in a second. I, I do want to point out um, we've got that new logo that you saw. We've got the new music, the new video for the introduction. Things are, are looking great. So I'd like to thank my brother, John Vanosky, for the logo. He did that for me and um, got a great guest. He's back with us. Uh, he was with us a few months ago. His name is Mark Mills. He is a senior fellow with the Manhattan Institute. Welcome, Mark. Great to be here. I'm glad to be alive, live <laughs> with you on your first live show here from uh, sunny Chevy Chase, Maryland, in the penumbra of the swamp of Washington, D.C., I'm glad it's sunny. Uh, there's not a lot else good I'm going to say about Washington, D.C. these Washington. days. That's, what else is new? <laughs> it is sunny here in Michigan as well. And, and Mark and I were talking before we got on. I promised him I would start with how he ended our last show, and that is with optimism. So, yeah. Mark, give us your optimistic assessment for this happy, sunny Friday. <laughs> well, you know, it's kind of a... It, the, the the word optimists and pessimists, I mean, you know, we've talked about this before. I get into it all the time because of the title of my my podcast is The Last Optimist. And my book is, is an optimistic book because it's a look at technology progress and where we're going in the United States in particular and in the world in general. And, but you often I often hear people uh, assume or accuse one of being a Pollyanna or naive if you're an optimist, because, you know, you didn't notice that there are strikes. You didn't notice the craziness in politics. You didn't notice the war in Ukraine. <clears throat> you didn't notice whatever environmental issue that one wants to worry about or angst over at, at the moment. There's, there's lots of problems in the world. So the, the real issue about the difference between optimism and pessimism is a, is a choice of a frame of mind, mm -hmm. as opposed to being naive, as you know. And I, I mean, I, uh, it's really hard to fight. I mean, being being optimistic uh, is a, is an act of will. It's easy to be pessimistic because there's a lot of bad stuff happening in the world, and there always is. So I guess yeah. high level, I would say is this. In, in, in particular, with respect to being optimistic about the United States, let's just say, as a country, and I'm an immigrant who became an American. You know, I escaped the uh, the great uh, cold north of Canada to. to go, uh, long, I, welcome to you. <laughs> yeah, well, you, where you live is a deep south from my perspective. You know, you have to go no, 800 miles north on the latitudes to get to, to my to my home. <laughs> but, you know, there's bad stuff going on. So at the beginning of my book, in fact, for the, the, the foreword, uh, I, I outline in just one page. I'm going to spend a long time on it. What was going on in the 1920s? And, you know, anybody could just go to Dr. Google and, and look up just what was going on. It was really, really a tough time. A lot of really crazy stuff. Race riots that required uh, martial law in cities. Uh, the Army Air Force bombed um, a black neighborhood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In the, oh, yeah. Over, you know, a race riot. I mean, literally bombing the American city. It's crazy. We had debates over a constitutional amendment. So there were two in one year. One which was insane, banning something that people have been consuming for all of history, alcohol. And the other, of course, was the uh, arrival of women's vote, which was controversial at the time. You know, we have the bias of 
presentism to think it was obvious it should happen. It was very controversial. It was a very divisive <clears throat> debate at the time. There's sexual revolution, if you like. Mm -hmm. and, and there was the uh, Bolshevik revolution just two years earlier in 1918, the Red Scare. We had yep. all kinds of, we had yellow journalism, fake news. We had all, all kinds of bad stuff going on. And oh, terrorism, by the way, the the uh, the biggest series of uh, explosions and deaths in America by domestic terrorists up until 9/11 was uh, in uh, in the in early 1920s on Wall Street, uh, where the oh, anarchists right. were mailing bombs and bombing, and killing people all over the country. It was killing judges. Uh, so it was it was a, it, and there were, there were um, strikes that make our strikes look like look like a kindergarten party. Uh, I mean, massive strikes, you know, weapons fired, you know, riots. Look where we are now. OK, we had world wars since then. We've had mm -hmm. a lot of bad stuff and depressions, but the world's a better place. There are fewer poor people. There's fewer people in abject poverty. Healthcare is better. Lifespans are longer. Uh, you, you, the list of things that are better, air quality is much better. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't put toxic pollutants in the in the in the rivers. You don't like, you know, the, the famous river fire in uh, Toledo. And uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, just from none of these things are extant. So the world's a better place. How'd that happen? Okay. Can it never happen again? I mean, are our troubles so bad, so grotesque that there's just no possibility that we'll figure out how to get to a, a better, brighter future? I think you can't predict the future, but given, given the dynamic of human nature in the past, I'm optimistic that we get through it and we, we resolve these things one way or the other. doesn't mean the resolutions are painless or easy. So optimism doesn't mean you're naive. Right. Like labor negotiations with the UAW now, these are painful for both counterparties and you can blame one side or the other. Fine. Uh, but it's, it's hard. It's hard work to negotiate. And that's true in our personal lives. When we, we have disagreements in our family, and I, I dare say more than a few of us have had to negotiate terms inside of the family dynamic. Right. Yep. Um, I love that take. It's interesting. I was I had breakfast with a friend of mine, um, Dave Youngman from DYS Media, our sponsor, yeah. who you'll hear about more uh, yeah. later. But um, we were talking and I told him what we were going to start with today. And he was tending toward the pessimistic. And I pointed out, yeah, yeah I mean, things are looking really bad when you pay attention to the news and pretty much anything these days, but have historical context because there were much worse times through our history. Yeah. Uh, but people tend to forget about that in some regard, because we've had really good times that we've lived through since. Right. Well, it, I mean, it's, it, it's, hum, I mean, the human nature part of how we think is tied into self-evidently the fact that we're human. Yeah. And we we, trained, we tend to forget or not study things that were painful. Uh, not all of us spend a lot of time reading history. I mean, history mm -hmm. is important. You know, the old adage, if you, you know, if you don't study, you're doomed to repeat it. And yeah. that's, but that's not new. That's been true for all of human history. So, yeah. and with a little luck, some wise heads are studying history and, uh, and giving advice. Sometimes you don't have such wise heads at the heads of government. But that's why you hope we have a democracy ultimately that we you know have these fights. But <clears throat> it, I, I think one of the reasons that uh, the psychology of it matters is that when you, you know, I'm a physicist that worked as an engineer and then I worked as a scientist and I got in, involved in finance, as you know. Yep. And one of, the, one of the lessons that you learn when you're in business is that it's the, the nature of human nature that really matters. How you manage people is a human nature thing, which Peter Drucker is focused on. How you forecast technologies is a lot about human nature, not about econometric modeling and about aspirations. It's about what people actually do with technologies, which sometimes is very surprising. How you operate a manufacturing plant. I mean, if there's any place, you know, you, I worked in a manufacturing plant. My first job, yep. as you and I talked about, or job, if it was Canadian, because I... <laughs> <laughs> was in a semiconductor fab, which is what you call a manufacturing plant for that. But mm -hmm. how you how you make it really work, obviously a lot of technology involved, but it's, it doesn't matter how much automation you have, it's about people. You have, right. the automation helps people, people maintain the automation, they invent the automation, their, their behaviors, their attitudes, safety, all these things are very much about, how, you know, how people really operate. People are successful at it, are really good at understanding that 
and good leaders, this is self-evidently the case. I learned this in the venture world. You know, you, yeah. your, your companies that succeed are run by people who, even if you think they're jerks, most often they're not. You know, they're, they're most often they're not the people you read about in the news. Mm -hmm. There's thousands of companies run by very competent people who understand human nature. Yep. So anyway, well, and it's not a technology issue. It's just, it's just the way it is. Uh, it's why I love manufacturing, my field. Um, you know, I always call it the crucible of the business world because in manufacturing, you're either making things that people want to buy for a price that's going to give you a profit or you're out of business. And um, that's what I like to write about. You know, it's another yeah. thing. You said the, the mindset is so important with optimism. I love to tell the feel-good stories. When I mean, go out, I had an article published at Forbes today on the Lockheed Martin inflatable space habitats. You know, oh, yeah. That's, that's cool. A bit of the good news. We're going back yeah. to the moon. Yeah. So we need someplace to stay and put our yeah. stuff. And Lockheed Martin's working on that and pretty darn close to having a solution that's ready to fly. So there is good news out there. Um, Mark's got it in his book. Let's talk more about the book. So I, I uh, didn't want to read the whole thing. It's scrolling at the bottom. Yeah. Cloud Revolution with a big long <laughs> subtitle. Subtitle's long. That's how new technologies will unleash next economic boom and a roaring 2020s. <clears throat> well, so, you know, when will the roaring start? Uh, <laughs> uh, so Lockheed Martin is part of uh, part of what's Absolutely. happening, but so is so is what Elon Musk is doing with not just SpaceX but with with Tesla. But you yep. know the comment you made about manufacturing, where you make things that people want, and you have to do it in a way that people can afford the product you make it. And I and I I've said this; it's in my book, but the, it's an obvious thing. Everything that exists to make civilization possible has two features, well, three, that everybody forgets about, but you say it, they're obvious. Everything starts with digging something out of the earth, right. the mining industry, everything, every product and service. Yeah, every, every of our last discussion. Yeah, and every service, every service that makes society possible requires you to manufacture a product to make the service possible, whether it's yep. what we're doing electronically, whether it's driving a truck. So manufacturing is is the at the epicenter that, uh, between your raw materials and things that are useful, but you need energy to do all of that because all, all of the tasks to, to put it sort of philosophically require stripping ent entropy out of things, stripping chaos and creating order and precision right. that yeah. always costs entropy. entropy. That's that sort of always costs energy, Get it, getting order, precision, beauty, convenience, speed, all the features, uh, whether it's a feature of a manufacturing plant or a feature of the product that you make cost energy. And so those things, those, that's why I study those things. But your point about manufacturing, we're having this debate about manufacturing cars because mm -hmm. the UAW is on strike. And your yep. point is a good one. You know, if a business makes something people want and they succeed at it, people will buy it. But we have this other factor called the government. Right. And other people who have opinions about what you should want and what you shouldn't be allowed to own. And that kind of throws a monkey wrench in the works of what manufacturers and how they can operate, right. let's say, optimally for, you know, for people. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I pointed out again and again, it's not just those direct mandates, but it's also the things that you don't see, the regulations that... American manufacturers, for example, have to abide by that our competitors overseas don't. You know, right. Like, whether that's um, safety for workers, which you know, certainly don't want to go away from that, but it's a cost and a, a, an additional hurdle. Environmental concerns, those are all things that add to our uh, burden in the places we have those requirements. And, you know, we hear about the Chinese and their slave labor and their despoiling of the environment it makes right. it a little tough to, to compete. Well, this is where the this is where naivete comes in as opposed to optimism and pessimism. We're prof yeah. profoundly naive to think that if we choose to do something that drives businesses out of business here and that product is manufactured in China, that they're going to do it in a way that we would, we would, if we knew, we would consider either socially, morally, or environmentally acceptable. Right. But yep. if, you know, the point you've made about uh, safety regulations is a really important one. Because to me, it epitomizes a uh, an error that people make in 
in analogizing why government regulation is good and therefore any government regulation in effect is acceptable and good. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've never met an, uh, in private or public, but certainly in private, any, anybody who runs a manufacturing plant who has ever complained about safety regulations. In fact, they've said the opposite. They've CEO right. a friend of mine runs a private um, steel foundry, small one, been in the family for three generations, Pennsylvania. So steel country. So that not only does does he welcome, you know, Bosha wants to come and do the regular audits and we <clears throat> follow the right. I, I don't want to hurt my employees. Right. And, and if I but what he worries about is if I follow the rules and they cost me money, but there's no regulations to make sure the other guy follow, doesn't follow the rules mm -hmm. then I'm at a real disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact. Now, that's true. Yeah. If the stuff's done in China. I got no way to impose the rules. Hence the problems we have in the geopolitics of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. But then when you add to that a regulation that says, well, you shall you shall manufacture an electric vehicle as opposed to mm -hmm. an internal engine. Well, that's, as they say, a horse of a different color. It's obviously very different and typically economically uh, destructive. And any mandates tend, tend to be, except if they're rare and applied in the times of you know, literal war, tend to be economically destructive. And by definition, they're economically destructive of time of war because war is both physically and economically destructive. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, I should jump in and, and also call someone else out. That's Gail Roberts. Uh, she's actually on with us right now. She is serving as our producer today. I'm brand new to everything I'm doing here today. <laughs> Gail's done it before. So she not only spent a bunch of time up front getting me ready for this, in the run-up to leaving for a uh, vacation very soon, but she is on with us today, acting as producer. There's Gail. Yay. Welcome. That's like that's <laughs> like it's like a real talk show where you have a producer. We can talk to our producer. It's great. Yes. I love it. Gail, what, uh, give us your thoughts on what we've hit on so far. Well, I was just writing something that may, uh, about uh, mandates being economically destructive, and I I think that's something that a lot of people don't really understand and mark you really put it well like I, like there's a time and a place and they they serve a purpose but it seems that they've almost become now uh the go-to whether it's banning right. plastics or um you know a mandate to for vaccination a mandate to go to ev so right. i guess the question i'd have is that um why do you think this is where is this coming from and uh Huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's is, 20 words or less. <laughs> this is, yeah. the, this is a, a, and I always read down to the obvious. This is the psychology question, not the physics question. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and it's an important one, and I don't, I don't dodge it, but it's easier to answer the physics question. Like, you, you could ask me if the mandate is that everybody has to buy an EV, Canada is going to ban internal combustion engines. England today said they're just going to push it back by a few years, but they're still going to ban them. So we're ban mandating all EVs. So that, there's a question you can one can answer. Will that work? Can you build that many EVs, that many batteries? And we know the answer to that. No. Right. And, and then we could spend a long time explaining why I say that. Not because you, you can, you should or shouldn't do the mandate. It's just, it won't happen. But when you say, why are they doing that? Okay, we know the answer to that. They're saying that's because of climate change. We have to cut CO2 emissions. Okay, uh, that's why they're doing it. It's not a mystery. They've said why. Mm -hmm. So my then I prefer to read down to not why do they believe that's important because they, they've told us the, the overlords that are going to mandate all vehicles is that I want to answer to the two separate questions that are answerable. So I can't get in their heads on their psychology, why they feel so it's so eager. And yes, they invoked it's the science, but it's not the science of the present. It's the science of guessing the future. But we do know that we, we, we can't make, we can't, we're not mining enough material. It's not that there's enough on the planet. Canada has lots of ore. I, used, I worked for a Canadian mining company in my youth. Lots of metals in the world. Yeah. We're not mining enough. We're not going to mine enough. We're not planning to mine enough. We can't build mines fast enough full stop. So that's not going to happen. What will happen is it'll make all cars more expensive and harder to get. And we also know it won't cut CO2 emissions very much because we can ask then physics engineering questions. Well, how do you get the copper to make the motors? Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? Well, big diesel trucks dig up lots of earth. How much earth? We can answer those questions. So that a whole chain of things can be answered if they're asked. They're not. And then you find out, wait a minute, it might not cut emissions very much. It's going to cost an awful lot. 
it's going to inconvenience people astonishingly because what will happen is you'll we're sort of going to cubify Canada in the United States. That is in Cuba when <laughs> after the revolution, they banned the importation of American cars and any cars related to America. So what happened in Cuba is that everybody's car, the, the most modern car you could buy in 1962, 10 years later, was a 1952 car. The most modern car you could buy in 1972 was a 1952 car. So used cars became very valuable and we and you just maintain them around them forever. We're going to do that if these laws stay in place. Yep. Why are they doing that? Well, they t they've told us, they, the overlords. So then you end up down a separate debate. Is that an appropriate solution to the problem that they've articulated? That's why I stick to the sort of the engineering physics is that, no, it's not. It's an expensive approach that won't work and will hurt people. So then we can have a different conversation. Well, what should we do instead? But no one wants to have that because they're so hard over of, I know I'm right. They cut because it has no tailpipe. An EV doesn't have an engine. Gee, what a genius observation. But what you'd want to know is what did it take to make the damn thing in the first place? Excuse uh -huh. my, my French Canadian uh, <laughs> euphemism. Uh, I used to speak en français, but I forgot most of my French. I'm sorry for my homeland. It's been too many years since I lived in Quebec City or Montreal. Anyway, I, so your why is really important. Um, and, and the right way to answer the why, I was testifying before Congress recently, and, and, and I said to both parties, whoever's in charge, they should they should do a, another question that journalists used to ask and that Congress and parliamentary, parliamentary committees can ask is, where's the money going? Follow the money. Because these things are really expensive, really expensive. We're talking about, in, in the United States, trillions of dollars, thousands of billions of dollars. In Canada... Yep hundreds of billions of dollars being allocated towards these aspirations. So part of the answer to why I suspect, call me a cynic, can be found in following the money. Who's getting the money? Who's benefiting from this? Because I can I can prove that you're not getting the benefit you think in environmental terms. In fact, that you're getting environmental degradation that you're not even aware of in other countries. So who's... Who's engaging? Let's just, let's just assume it's honest. It's, I'm not accusing anybody of cheating or lying. I just want to know who's, first order, who's benefiting. Right. The second order would be, if you're a good journalist, if there, were, if there were investigative journalists left in the world, there's a few, uh, who's cheating? Who's stealing the money? Yep. Because there's always theft, but once you spend this quantity of money, you know the amount of theft and graft and bribery is, has to be at epic levels. I mean, the United States has never spent, and this would be true for Canada. I haven't looked at the numbers closely, but I bet it's true. There's never been so much money spent on industrial policy. This is basically industrial policy yep, in right. the history of either country that is rife territory for graft and corruption. I yep. would, you don't even have to disagree with their goals, the, the why question. You should be curious about who's Who's cheating? Who's stealing? I mean, you, you, certainly you'd want your goals to be going to the stated purposes of what the money's for. Well, of course, with money, we can always print more, right? So <laughs> we're in good shape. How much for inflation? That'd be another <laughs> question. I'm just um, curious where, where, how much they think this won't, why do they think this won't fuel inflation? Yeah, the but inflation if, reduction. And more money to do the, exactly the same thing. This is the textbook definition of inflation. Yep. So Canada and the United States are printing money not to go to the moon. We're not spending any more money on the moon. That budget's fixed and it's chump change. It just is by these standards. We're printing more money to do exactly the same thing. Make a car. It's, just the same. it's a car. It's still just a day. It's still just a car, but it's going to cost more. Uh, it's just a kilowatt hour to heat your house and run the computer, but it's going to cost more. So the printing the extra money to do exactly the same thing, regardless of your goal, that's called inflation. Yep. Yep. Well said. We're going to take a quick break, uh, hear from our sponsor. We will be right back very shortly. EYS Media, your digital media relations agency, public relations, website design, digital marketing. You get found by the customers and talent who need your solutions. You get media placements and top publications, the best job candidates coming to your website, a digital presence that gets you found by the right people. Call 616 
298-2988-8798 to get started today. So thanks as always to our sponsor, DYS Media. Go look them up. They'll do a great job for you. We are back with Mark Mills, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And we've got our producer, Gail Roberts, uh, with Gail Now, helping us out. Thank you both. It's it's delightful. Where's, where's Mr. Producer, Miss Producer? Oh, <laughs> hiding. Bring, we'll bring her right back here. There she is. I, was gonna, I said Sorry I want to step Gail. out because so the focus <laughs> could be on Mark. I will say this as a Mark, I am a recovering journalist. And Yay. <laughs> One of the things, and there's a reason I put recovering in front, uh, because I do wonder why there isn't, you know, there are more questions asked. Yeah. And obviously my show that I have is called Curious Minds for exactly what you just talked about. Because one of the things I was really impressed by what you said is that you were talking about facts and data and information and not emotion. Right. And I, it's almost a parallel issue with what I see happening in the plastics world that I've done a lot of research right. on. And, you know, plastics is, you know, 1% of the overall waste and um, yet we vilify it and want to ban it. And I, and it's this, I, yeah, I just shake my head because I'm like, well, people, please look at the facts. <laughs> yeah. Well, so let me give you a plastic fact that would be fun since you're, uh, and I've studied a lot of the world of polymers and plastics. And as you know, because you've, you're working in it, most people who study this would point out that 80% to 90% of the products and devices that are used in, in healthcare domains are all polymer based and plastics based. Yep. Uh, it, it's a, it's miraculous. And the amount of food that's not wasted because you can shrink wrap them in plastics compared to old conventional pa pa packaging well, is in is economically environmentally astonishing gain. And, but here's and the fact I'll inject there the lives that are saved from a food safety perspective. Of course. I mean, it's incredible. So yeah. since we since we had this big debate about plastic straws and all this, you know, angst and plastic water bottles, I just did a, a little calculation some, some years ago on the a comparison. So the quantity of non-recyclable plastic can't be recycled in a small wind farm because the blades are just giant, they're 15 ton blades each of plastic. So one small wind farm that can power a few thousand homes has more non-recyclable plastic in the wind turbine blades than all the plastic straws in the world combined. So, sorry for the dog. This is a lie. <laughs> he was alarmed by that. <laughs> so if you're worried about plastic, think plastic's a problem. Maybe you should ban wind turbines until they can make them. Oh, I don't know. Go back to the Middle Ages. You can make them out of wood. You can't make big wind turbines with wood blades, so we'll nope. just have to put up with a lot less electricity, I guess. Uh, maybe we could start cutting down our redwoods to make those. There's an idea for you environmentalists out there. <laughs> Mark, you uh, commented some about the EV situation and the minerals and all that, but you actually had an article that popped on, into my feed when I first got up this morning at City Journal today, and that's about the EV jobs. So talk yeah. a little bit more about that topic because it's something i really hadn't even thought about and you were spot on yeah it's you know it, it, there's, there's two things that you can follow in engineering terms you can follow the money money always matters but that relates to jobs U, uaw strike is they've stated what it's about they want essentially a, a big raise 40 percent and affects canada too because the automotive ecosystems are, are are sort of border free they're fully integrated a lot of things that get uh produced in one country move to the next one for assembly back to ours back and forth so all, what's also being said and you've you've it's being said everywhere the underlying reason for the uaw strike is that the world's going through a transition to evs which are simpler vehicles and since they're simpler vehicles they take less labor so the ua uaw is trying to grab some money now while the going's good because we're going to need less labor in the future to make cars if we go all evs well, okay, I, you can get their their argument because billions of dollars are being given away to companies to subsidize EVs, but they didn't get any of the money at the UAW. Their yeah. wages didn't go up, so yeah. they got a beef, right? You can you can't blame them for. I mean, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars. The problem is that the claim is not true, and you can find this out. With, it's not complicated. So I I started sort of doing the obvious. I looked up online the data for different kinds of manufacturing plants. You know, transmission factories, battery factories, engine factories, refineries to make copper. Those are factories. They make 
pure yep. copper parts, electric motor factories, power semiconductor factories, because EVs have a transmission that's different than a mechanical transmission. They have something called high power power electronics. You, you control the flow of power from an engine to the, to the axle with a drive shaft and a transmission. You control the flow, flow of power from a battery to the motor at the wheel with power electronics that it controls electron flows, but it's a transmission system. It's just a different one. So what you'd want to know is how many people does it take to make a thousand EVs overall counting all that stuff? And how many people does it take overall, not at GM, which assembles them, but right. the suppliers do. Public data. So I looked it up. T Tesla's workforce globally, Tesla's total e production of EVs last year works out to about 80 people they employ per thousand vehicles that they sell. Well, actually, it's closer to 90, 88. But anyway, you, they make other stuff, so I discounted that. Only about 5% of their sales are power walls and uh, you know solar panels. If you look at the auto industry, not GM, if you look at just GM, by the way, it's it's only 40 people per 1,000 vehicles because mm -hmm. they get suppliers. But if you count all their suppliers, mm -hmm. it's about 80. So there's actually fewer people in the overall uh, ecosystem make a conventional car then make an EV. The te Tesla's the pure play example. And Tesla makes it designed and makes its own electric motors, not just batteries and battery cells. So they're, they're vertically integrated. So that tells you first off, the trope, the trope's a trope. It's not true at the high level. Say, well, what's going on? So I look, I look just the battery, uh, the battery and the electric motor and Tesla publishes data. It's public, they're a public company. How many people do they employ just to make the drivetrain, which is the battery, mm -hmm. and the electric motor? And that's another number. So it's, you know, you look at that and you come up with, uh, I forget what I put in my piece. It's 80, I think it's uh, 10 people per drivetrain. And so then what you do, I think it's just under 10, maybe eight or nine per drivetrain, per, per, sorry, per thousand drivetrains, per thousand drivetrains. Then you go to public data on engine plus transmission. It's four people to make an engine and transmission. Two per, two per thousand transmissions, two per thousand engines at the factories that make those. So it's half the number of people for the drivetrain. Okay, and the drivetrain is all done, but with the electric vehicle, I still have to make the power electronics transmission. Well, nobody has published data on that. So I used a surrogate. I looked at the number of people employed in the power electronics industry per million dollars of sales. And it turns out kind of interestingly enough, it's about the same number of people per million dollars of sales to make power electronics as to make an automatic transmission. So, I mean, the whole thing is, it's really interesting when you just, pull the numbers out. These are public numbers and no one's ever done a proper study. I, I did not do a proper study. I said on my paper, no one's done a proper study. I looked at the high level numbers, the high level numbers. This, this, this is me being curious. <laughs> so I wonder how many people work there. I wonder mm -hmm. how many things they make. Why is nobody asked that question? Why did they all babble the same thing? Well, it's because this is the trope. Electric vehicle has a simple motor with a single one or two moving parts and a battery. Simple. Internal combustion engine has that engine with hundreds of thousand parts. True. But that's because they don't, nobody is curious enough to look online to look at what is that battery? Well, it turns out it's a half ton thing, twice the weight of an engine. Mm -hmm. It weighs a half ton and it contains thousands of parts, thousands of welds, a power electronic system, a structural system, and a cooling system. That kind of sounds like a complicated thing. <laughs> you shouldn't be surprised it takes more labor to make something actually more complicated than an internal combustion engine. So, But no one was curious enough to because they think in their heads, this would be the why question that Gail would have. Why did they yes. think that? Because they think it's like a double A battery on steroids. It's just right. a simple thing you stick in the car and boom, it goes. No. It's a complex electrochem electrochemical thing that wears out just like an engine at the molecular level and has attributes which are actually much worse than a conventional engine. You can't fix it. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Gail, you're right. We need more curiosity. Uh, and, and that was fantastic because it, what that also implies is we have our American government policy now actively steering jobs away from right. Americans to foreign nationals and other countries. Well, to, to, to steal curious minds again from Gail, wouldn't you be curious to know how many people it takes to make the materials to make the battery mm -hmm. versus to make the conventional car? I mean, why not ask? 
I looked yep. it up. Uh, it's 60 times more labor to make the ma materials to make an EV than the materials to make a conventional car. Conventional yep. car is almost all iron and steel, 85% iron and steel. An EV is 70% copper, nickel, manganese, cobalt, graphite, aluminum, and they're all much more manufacturing labor intensive than steel. Steel's really easy to make. It's yep. iron ore is really common, lots in Canada and northern United States. You literally just shovel it up. It's just like dirt. And you make it into steel, it doesn't take a lot of labor. Copper, not so. The graphite, no. Lithium, no. So where is that labor? Some of it's in Canada, because Canada is a little more friendly to mining and refining than America is. But most of it's not. Most of it's in, in Africa and Asia. China is the utter dominant player in the refining process, which is a manufacturing mm -hmm. process. You, you know, refining yep. milk and refining copper are just manufacturing processes. Yep. They're very labor intensive. Uh, they're actually hard to do. They're dirty to, 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 to do cleanly. Not impossible. But that labor is in China. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other frustrating thing is the same administration that is claiming to have these impeccable uh, environmental credentials is preventing us from doing the mining and the processing here in the U.S., where we have those standards and, and regulations we talked about earlier. And all that processing, which is a very dirty and potentially environmentally harmful and dangerous uh, undertaking, is going to countries that don't have those safeguards. Right. Like Canada. <laughs> That's not who I was thinking. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't want to insult my, my homeland. But the, 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 only, the only new lithium refinery being built right now, and give him credit, is Elon Musk it broke ground uh, last month in Corpus Christi, Texas. So yeah. Texas is the Canada of the United States in terms of its, its, its affection for difficult to build manufacturing facilities and oil yeah. refineries and stuff. Although Canada's reversing course, the last I checked, on its tolerance for these kinds of things. So I think it's going to be far harder to open a mine in Canada in the next uh, few years than it, yeah. it has yeah, been. It's crazy. You know, first of all, we don't have the quantities, like you said. So not digging our own up is kind of self-defeating. But then, yeah, that whole deal of just making it impossible to to uh, do the downstream processing and, and refining, we're just pushing the what could be minimal environmental impact to countries that are going to make it a maximum environmental impact. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> craziness. Um, we've talked a little bit about the UK developments on net zero, but I wanted you to dig in a little more on that before we wrap up here. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, the UK has announced a little bit of a dial back on the timing for the mandate for EVs. And the, now they're under great fire from the, environmentalists saying they're giving up on net zero, but not really the case, is it, Mark? No, I mean, I think it's a, um, a it's an acknowledgement on the part of the prime minister of England that the, what I said, he, somebody has told, they're, they're in a hard, they're in a rock in a hard place. They've, they've pledged to, to do something that they know can't be done. Right. So the real, the real issue is whether or not you just kick the can down the road and reverse the pledge the year before it kicks into place or do it now. And the problem with waiting is that you get a lot of capital misallocation. Mm -hmm. So if, if you have aspirations that you want to have something happen quickly and spend a lot of money and throw money at it, markets will respond. Uh, but the outcome may not be what you want. And, and it may be very economically damaging, which is what I think they've realized. But but the politics right. are that he's backing off. Uh, so what, it, what they're going to have to do is be more candid about two things in order to do the, the slow walk. They don't have to abandon it. I don't think politically they can, but they right. have to be more candid about two things, which is one is where, where, the, where the materials are going to come from, when we can get them, and the environmental costs of getting those materials. And so that means you just have to be, you don't have to abandon your goals. You have to be more patient to say, well, we have to find ways to achieve those goals that are more environmentally acceptable and more economically viable, and that will take longer. So that's the political out. It's also the truth because it's, <laughs> right. not, it's not that you... It's not that you can't imagine mining at scale to make enough copper, let's say. Of course you can. Yeah. But you, but you, but it's impossible to do it in, in five to 10 years. It's just impossible. You can't yep. open that many mines. Up. Even if you had no regulations, it's just not going to happen. So you, you, somewhere along the line, someone's going to finally have to, you know, call time out for reality. 
But if you wait too long, it's it's very, very damaging because that's why Ford was whining and complaining, Ford England, Ford UK, about yeah. the backing off because they're you know they're rushing to meet the mandate and the mandate gets pushed down, pushed down on time. And that leaves them exposed with misallocated capital. You, you can't blame them for complaining. Yeah. How do you see that shaking out then? You know, uh, I fully agree that we're on a path that can't be accomplished from already the, the regulations and mandates that have been announced and been imposed. At some point we run into, into reality, but yeah. how do you see that shaking out? You know, as we go forward, how much damage are we going to do to ourselves before we realize? Well, yeah, this is, this is the bifurcation of being the optimist and the pessimist. <laughs> yeah, coming right back full circle. Uh, <laughs> the, pes the pessimistic side of me says, we're just going to, we're going to bankrupt a lot of companies and it'll be economically destructive. The optimistic side of me says that the indicators are like what the PM just did in the UK. And I think what will happen regardless of how the election comes out in the United States because of the consequences of the actions. I think in the, in the next political cycle here, we're going to see some similar slowdown and back off just because of the obviousness of the economic costs, the geopolitical mm -hmm. costs and the environmental degradation. You already have lots of the mainstream media to use that line, Washington post, New York times, New Yorker, the Atlantic, all, you know, serious and NPR serious, news stories <clears throat> looking at the environmental impacts of more nickel mining, copper mining, lithium mining, where, where it's actually happening. And all the reporters are all shocked to learn what was really involved. Yeah, what it So takes. people are becoming aware. The awareness will, I think, slow these things down. And I hope so, because if you think about capital allocation, you know, the electric car is a great option. I'm gonna, you know, I want to be really clear. I think we talked about this last time, but I have to mm -hmm. say it again, because people assume, because I'm dealing in reality that I'm anti-EV. I, I like EVs. I mean, my next car is going to be a plug-in hybrid. I have a hybrid now. Mm -hmm. I can afford one, thank God, because, you know, you're paying me so much money to be on your show. <laughs> and, huh, that's truly a joke, right? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> you can buy me dinner later. I when will. I, I will. But, but I go, <laughs> go to Washington. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the, the uh, it, it's an expensive option, but it's a really attractive option, a plug-in hybrid, because you get the best yeah. of both worlds. You can drive without going to a gas station around town. You know, on the highway, you can go with whatever range you want. You refuel in three minutes, boom, booms. Uh, it's, it, it's what the future is going to be mm -hmm. for people who can afford them. And they'll get a little cheaper, but they're always going to be more expensive than a, a straight a straight internal combustion car because yeah. it's got more options. But I, I like I think they're great. There'll be lots of them. There'll be millions more of them in the country, and it's a good thing. But the misallocation yeah. of capital means that let's just stick with auto companies. They're burning through money that could do one of two things or both. One would be to pay workers more. Okay. That's what UAW is basically saying. Right. So you bring yep. manufacturing efficiency allows you to increase labor wages. That's always been the tug. The other thing they could do is allocate money to really cool new things that for transportation. And as you know, mm -hmm. we've talked off channel about this. One of my favorite new potential cars, well, two of my, my two favorite cars, <clears throat> different timelines is a flying car, which no longer crazy. There's about a yeah. hundred ventures, probably 20 that are very serious globally, air taxis, flying cars. It's basically, you know, personal, personal quadcopter, personal helicopter, personal airplane, but far cheaper than a regular airplane, far safer, far easier. Not mm -hmm. crazy, expensive, not crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. And Aston Martin is developing one and, you know, some car companies, but my, the, my favorite cool car is a walking car. So, you know, Hyundai is yep. infamously famously for the, for the technorati among us, they can find us with the, the Google machine. It is really cool. I mean, it looks like a regular car, but the wheels lock in place. They articulate up on, 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 on our legs and it walks on a on, on tough territory. When I first saw that uh, prototype design two years ago, I said, but there are some smart engineers that, when they announce that vehicle, the order book for it will fill up faster than the Cybertruck because it's a phenomenologically different kind of vehicle. Yeah. A, a, a vehicle that has a battery instead of an internal combustion engine, it's like buying diesel versus gasoline at the fundamental level. It doesn't yeah. have any particular attributes that are profoundly different. Some are mm -hmm. different, like you have portable power and you can drive each wheel and make the vehicle catwalk, fun stuff. Yeah. But a walking car, I mean, way cooler, what? I mean, all the off-roaders and, of course, a walking car will cause less damage off-road. I mean, right. if, if you wanted to go explore nature instead of, you know, tearing through territory on four wheels, you can delicately walk into the 
nature preserve. Well, I mean, in a, yep. it's w incredibly awesome, incredibly different, p difficult piece of engineering, but good on Hyundai for doing that. I mean, wow. Yeah. So a, a great plug for my friends out at uh, Hyundai's New Horizon Studios in Bozeman, Montana. Um, yeah, you, we yeah, are out of time, did you, did you Mr. Mills. Did you, go to, did you go to the studio? I did not go to the studio. I went to Bozeman and I met with those guys for uh, an expo that was out there. To, to that secret I spoke the at. And uh, of course, I had interviewed yeah. the VP in charge, John Sa, uh, a year before that. And I've written now the Forbes story and yeah. had uh, Jake Bernal, the engineer on the show here a couple months ago. Well, when, when you go to, when they let you into the, into this, into the secret proving grounds, you can get, go see it In, invite me. I won't make okay. you pay me and we can go and do a joint show of the real future of transportation from Bozeman, Montana. And I, I write a bit about that in my book, but I, I didn't spend a lot of time on the walking car because, well, you know, it's just, it's not a book about cars. It's a book about yeah. technology. Well, you can find out more about that on my Forbes story, but you should also check out Mark's book. The banner is up right now. Mark Mills, um, always a pleasure. We will definitely have you on again when when I save up enough pennies to pay you your ex exorbitant salary. You got, next you got to drive me to Bozeman. I want to go to drive a walking car. Yeah, you've fact, you've you don't have to pay me for that. That'll be okay. too much fun. I'll, so I'll pay John, you. Uh, Jake Bernal, you, you are now on notice. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jim. We are through. And... Uh, as always, the, the recorded show is out every Tuesday. This will be our episode next week. And um, definitely tune in for the, the future episodes. Um, Mark brings a special kind of know-how and delivery. Um, can't promise all of them will bring that, but they'll all bring something special. Thanks again.